Hello and welcome to a Critical Dragon where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books. And today I want to talk about uh, an element of narrative structure. Now, I've talked about this element before in relation to uh, supernatural sort of urban fantasy. <clears throat> and what I'm talking about is something that Fyra Mendelssohn described in her book, Rhetorics of Fantasy, about intrusion fantasy, about the structure and the movement of the fantastic within the text. But I'm going to be talking about it by analogy to alternate history, because I've been watching uh, For All Mankind, uh, an alternate history about the space race. And it's been absolutely fascinating, but it got me thinking about what it is that we like in the first installment of something and how series as a concept, a continuing series, changes the narrative paradigm that we are reading, that when we compare the first installment to a much later installment, they are actually radically different in how they approach the element. Now, obviously, for, uh, for all mankind, it's not the fantastic, it's alternate history. But there is an, an analogy with how Mendelssohn described intrusion fantasy in Rhetorics of Fantasy and how that applies to an urban fantasy series, that we can see a similar sort of thing happening in a series that is alternate history, but carries on. So what do I mean by all of this? When Mendelssohn was talking about uh, intrusion fantasy, she was locating the, the fantastic, so the magical world or the magical threat, and how there is a mundane reality so if you take Dresden as an example, Harry Dresden, the Jim Butcher books, you have Chicago, you have Monday in Chicago. And the initial impetus for the story, where the tension is derived, is Harry is protecting Monday in Chicago from the intrusion of a magical or fantastical element that is threatening. Them. And therefore, the tension of the novel, the driving force of the novel, is trying to protect Chicago from this magical attack. And that, that is the structure of the narrative content. For the first few books, uh, in the Suki Stackhouse books, there's an initial revelation that vampires exist and a vampire arrives in their community. And the protagonist, Suki Stackhouse, they have the Southern Vampire Mysteries by Charlene Harris. That's the name of the series, but everyone just calls them the Suki Stackhouse books. But Suki then is the sort of mediator between this intrusion of the fantastic element into her mundane reality. That's, again, a lot of the impetus of the first book. When we think of a lot of these urban fantasy series, the first book usually involves a protagonist who is recently discovered the mundane or recently discovered the, the fantastic, the, the magical, or works in a field that is in some way between the magical and the mundane. They, they deal with the fantastical elements intruding into the mundane. A lot of the books function this way. But if they are part of a series, as the series goes on, the mundane becomes less and less mundane. It becomes less and less like our reality because each investigation into each uncovered facet of the supernatural reality or the magical reality or the fantastical reality, the story moves its focus there because for a lot of these series, that's where the, the tension, the drama, the innovation, the, the fun is. And so if you compare the first book with, say, the fifth or the seventh or the tenth book in one of these series, those later books are almost secondary world fantasies. Now, the context, the baseline reality, is one in which the fantastical reality is A, paramount, B, much more developed, C, there is an assumption that we as readers know about it, and the book is focused almost solely on those aspects, not on the mundane or the impact on the mundane or even protecting the mundane. Sometimes it's 
a magical threat that's just being dealt with. And it's not necessarily a magical threat to the mundane. We have moved almost entirely away from the mundane into the fantastical reality, which is in much closer uh, sort of alignment with the creation of a secondary world fantasy. So the reason I laid all of this out is for all mankind, for those of you who haven't seen it, is an alternate history. It's an alternate history initially set at the, the beginning of the space race between the USSR and the USA about landing on the moon. That, that is where it starts. And one of the joys of the start of an alternate history is quite often the closeness between the alternate history to our own history, our own knowledge of the, the world. And we can compare and contrast. We can see these small differences. We can see how one change suddenly sets them on a different trajectory. But because that change has only just happened, we are at that position whereby it is a direct compare and contrast that this is slight differences to our world. We see how things would play out slightly differently. It's a what if scenario. What's interesting about this, like the urban fantasy series, as a series progresses in an alternate history, as time moves forward, we have essentially the butterfly effect because uh, we have changed a fundamental parameter at the beginning, the ramifications of that diverge that reality further and further and further away from our own. So that something changing at the beginning of the space race sets the USA on a different trajectory. As a result, the second season doesn't share quite as much with our reality as the first season. did. The third season, even less with our reality. The fourth season, we are now in a complete science fictional universe. It, it has completely changed that aspect of the show. And the thing is, if, as with urban fantasy or um, in these alternate histories, if our interest is, I like these things because, oh, look, it's, they're protecting this and this thing is coming in, or this is only a slight difference. If that is our reason for enjoying them, how can we still enjoy the later, uh, the later volumes, the later books, the, the later parts of these series that fundamentally are radically different? And, and it's fascinating because the narrative shifts radically from one type of storytelling with one set of parameters into something that is actually functioning very, very differently. And of course, part of this is if you start out at the beginning of a series, it is the slow incremental building up of understanding of the world, quite often along with the protagonist or along with the heroes that we as reader are slowly learning. And as we become more comfortable, as we move along, we've accepted this as the reality of the situation. We know who the characters are, and these are further adventures of these characters, that the aspect initially of this intrusion in urban fantasy or the minor difference that has changed the shape of things. We're now invested in the continuing story because we've invested in the characters, we've invested in this world, and we are following the logical trajectory and progression of a world. And we see it as a, with a sense of continuity. But again, when we compare these early books to these later books, they function completely differently. They are not the same. So if we think of uh, some great historical fantasy or historical fiction, the life of Caesar. Now, if someone starts with that and then they make a change, Caesar isn't killed by Brutus. That's the shift that we see and we go, oh, I wonder how this will play out. Fast forward a hundred years. What are the ramifications of that that this author is teasing out? Suddenly we're just in a completely parallel reality that, does not bear resemblance to our own. So we don't have that initial, hmm, I wonder. Now we're in a, a completely different world. But because it is part of this progression, we're, in, we're already invested. In and so I think this is a really interesting aspect of what series structure can do, particularly continuing series or uh, series that 
progress along a, a sort of linear chronology using a lot of the self same characters. Now, the repercussions of the actions in the first are borne out, and that gives us that sense of continuity. Uh, we see elements of this when something is done badly. So, for instance, let's say you have a giant franchise in the cinema, not naming anyone in particular, that maybe stars superheroes. I don't know. And they have a giant climactic event that shapes the world and there are ramifications. And then they just pay lip service to it in a later movie. We can feel that there's a sense of discontinuity because while they're saying the thing happened, they're not paying attention to how that would have changed the world. They've kind of reset to a base norm as if the world wouldn't be changed by these things. And that can break our sense of immersion. So if, say, for instance, in this fictional franchise that I'm talking about, some character snaps their fingers and half of everyone is wiped out, there are massive ramifications. For that. And then if it is reversed, but people still experienced a gap of time where this had occurred. Even a movie set one year later, we'd still be dealing with the ramifications of half the world's population suddenly reappearing and the chaos of that. But that is a lot of complexity to work into potentially a slightly simplistic action superhero film. But because the expectation is that this is an element of continuity, that this is an element of an expanding and increasingly intricate world, then we can, be feel, we can feel a little let down that it's not exploring ramifications. It's sort of going, oh, well, that thing just changed everything back to normal. And we know that's not how things work. And I think this is, this is a, an illustration of how Certainly, certain types of narrative are very simplified forms of, uh, of storytelling in that they have a focus on telling the one story and they don't want to deal with an exploration of the messy complexity that we would get in real life. But what's interesting for me, again, to bring this back to alternate history and for all mankind, each time they try to make these links to things that happened in our world. But the longer the series has gone on, the more difficult it is to make that because their world has radically shifted. And they could have started the very first episode of For All Mankind. They could have started with episode one of season four. And we would have looked at it and gone, oh, it's a science fiction show. It's just a science fiction show. This isn't, this is just a, an alternate earth in the future with this level of technology. We would approach it with a completely different set of sort of criteria in our head. Whereas if we'd followed it from the first episode of season one, we're seeing this as an extrapolation of a slightly altered history and then tracing those ramifications out. And so how we approach it, how we think about it, actually shows how our assumptions and perceptions of the genre, perceptions of what type of narrative it is, shapes how we actually understand it. And that locates an awful lot of power in the, the reader or the viewer, because we can say we are dissatisfied with this because it, it did X. Whereas in, in a completely different narrative, it doing X would not be a problem. We'd be fine with it. So it's not that X in and of itself is a problem. It's that in the context in which we are analyzing with the expectations that we have and the assumptions we are making and the criteria we are applying, X fits in one place, but does not fit in the other. So if you have read a long series, something like The Dresden Files or The Southern Vampire Mysteries or The um, Interview with the Vampire, uh, that series, The Vampire Chronicles. If you compare some of the later books, just flip them open and look how they start, look how they're addressed. Then look at the first book. 
just to see how radically different the style is, the approach is, the assumptions are. And it can be like, it's the same characters. They have the same type of dialogue. They're approaching those things the same way. A lot of kind of content aspects might be the same, but how the information is relayed to the reader, the expectations about reader assumptions, reader knowledge, reader understanding, those are all completely different. When we then break down, where is the threat in this book? Where is the peril in this book? How is the fantastic um, interacting with the mundane? Where is the comparison to our world? It shows us how, even though they're part of the same series, they can be radically different books because we have incrementally been conditioned to it. Like a frog, the, the hypothetical frog in the, the boiling pot. If you slowly increase the temperature, and that's what we have with series. And so the structure of series is not just about uh, incident one, incident two, incident three, as the thing goes along. It actually changes how we understand, appreciate, and engage with the narrative in front of us. And series is different to a trilogy. Trilogy is a closed narrative set where we have an expectation about book one, while it'll have elements of closure at the end, is setting up book two. Book two is expansive and is dealing with situating and contextualizing everything. And book three is going to be the conclusion. With a series, that actually gets a lot more complex. And the shifts and changes over time can be really fascinating to, to have a look at. But I've rambled about this. This is, is something that I find really curious because I've been enjoying For All Mankind, despite the slight melodramatic elements, but the situation of the human drama in the context of the space race in an alternate history. It has all of these elements that are absolutely fascinating. And it made me think about the impact that series structure has on how we consume, interact, and think of the narrative in front of us. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support and I will see you in the next one.